Hello and welcome back to 5-Minute Bibliography from Pequot Library. I am, as ever, your host, Dr. Jamie Cumby. I'm Pequot's Special Collections Librarian, and um, I'm joined today by someone who now seems to be a regular guest on the series. This is my lovely assistant, Fredson Bowers. And um, we're going to talk to you a little bit today about how the very first presses worked. Um, we're going to do something a little bit different in this video. I'm going to cut in a moment to some slides that I put together because what I want to do is to walk through the way that um, these presses were constructed and how they functioned using images that were actually made in their early modern period. Um, something really cool to note also is that um, this technology, when it first debuted um, on the stage in the um, early 1450s um, in Mainz uh, with Gutenberg workshop, um, a lot of those features remain fairly stable for about 200 years. Um, there are some notable changes. Uh, as I've mentioned in earlier videos, um, Gutenberg's spindle was actually made of wood. Um, so making that metal really improved the efficiency of early presses because, you, as you can imagine, um, you lose a lot of energy if you're turning a, a wooden spindle in a wooden frame. Um, but without further ado, uh, let's dive right in and look at some images of, uh, of presses. So what we're looking at here is the very first printed image of a printing workshop. Um, this is from 1499. It's from a book of the Danse Macabre, the Dance of Death, um, produced in Lyon um, by Martin Huss. And um, what we're seeing here, in addition to the fanciful skeletons, is um, all some the, uh, the moving pieces that make up a print shop. On the far left, you see your compositor hard at work. You see in his hand, he has his composing stick and next to him is the form that he's going to um, set his text into and that form is going right over to the right of him to the printing press as it stands. And here you see um, right behind the skeleton who's pointing his finger, you've got um, a jolly fellow um, holding what looks like a big powder puff. That's actually an ink ball. That is for inking the form. And the gentleman who's being pulled along by the pointing skeleton is the press man. He's the one who actually turns that, um, you see that spindle there? He's the one who's creating the pressure that prints the image onto the page. And um, all the way over to the far right, you have your bookseller. But um, we're just going to zero in now on um, our ink man and our press man and the press that they're operating. Now we're hurtling forward in time to 1751. Um, this is an image taken from the famous Encyclopédie of Diderot and D'Alembert. And um, what it wanted to do was to try to corral all uh, that was valuable and important in human knowledge. And um, part of that was representing all the different uh, processes of printing. So um, as I mentioned before, the uh, model of the wooden hand press um, that we see here is actually pretty similar to the one that would been used by Huss in 1499 and um, indeed Gutenberg in the 1450s. Um, and uh, so we're going to use this image to learn a little bit about the different features of the press. What I've done here is I've labeled all the different bits of this press that you can follow along as I describe how it works and what it does. Um, so basically, operating a press is generally done with a team. Um, this can be a pair of pressmen that would alternately pull the ball or beat the form, which is um, the term that we use for applying ink to the raised surface of the type. Um, again, that's where the ink balls that look like powder puffs come in. Um, another print worker, the puller, would take a fresh sheet of paper and affix it to the tympan, which is that bit that's hanging off the, uh, the top end of that sort of uh, tray with the press. And um, the tympan is then held in place with two pins, which you can actually see in the lower image. The puller then lowers the frisket over the tympan that's that sheet with those little windows cut out of it. Basically, what the frisket does is it just helps ensure that no excess ink makes it onto the page. It keeps things neat. Um, in order to further expedite this work, there might be an apprentice or another youngster who is often called a printer's devil um, who might be tasked with whisking freshly printed sheets off of the form and bringing them to be dried. So the kind of central action of the work, the actual pressing of the image onto the sheet of paper is done uh, by pulling the bar. That moves the spindle that lowers the platen. This is kind of a heavy rock. Um, and that is what creates the pressure that um, creates that transference, um, that 
allows the relief print to be made. Uh, this design should look familiar to you um, because Gutenberg actually modeled it after a wine press. So it was actually really a, an excellent invention that um, a few other bells and whistles were added onto. There's just one other thing that I'm going to bring up as well. Um, so at this point, you can have two different sort of models of press. You can have a one-pull press or a two-pull press. That means that um, in order to kind of lower the, um, the sheet of paper under the platen so that you can get the impression, you either do that in one go with one pull of the bar. That um, has the advantage of being a little faster, but you'll get a little bit more of an indistinct image around the edges. Or you can do a tool pull press where the platen is pressed onto the page of paper um, twice. So you get, um, again, that's two pulls of the bar, but you'll get a more thoroughly inked image. I should mention that when you're using a two-pull press, you're not um, impressing the image twice. You're impressing half of the image and then the other half of the image. And um, the, uh, the sheet of paper is positioned under the platen with the crank of a screw, which actually you can see in the lower image again. Um, so that's yet another moving part of um, the process. It gets a little bit more complicated. Not a ton more complicated, but um, there's this added element that um, you see, which adds some variance. Uh, well, I hope you've enjoyed uh, this installment of 5-Minute Bibliography. Um, just a quick reminder, keep sending in your questions as they come up. They might uh, show up in a later mailbag segment, or we might turn them into the topic of an entire video. And uh, we'll catch up with you guys next week. Have a good one.